morning, everyone, and welcome to First uh, Presbyterian Church Online. As always, uh, I'm so glad that you could uh, take the time to uh, be with me during this uh, video worship time. And a special uh, hello and a blessing to all dads out there on this uh, Father's Day Sunday. I hope uh, this day will be special to you. And as the province has begun to restrict, uh, uh, reduce the restrictions on visitations, um, on getting together, I hope that maybe you'll be able to see some of your family face to face, and I hope that is so. Again, a special blessing to you today. I continue my series on the parables uh, of Jesus, and today uh, is uh, the parable of the lost sheep and the lost coin. And I've entitled I've titled this uh, particular message uh, "Lost and Found." But before I go any further, would you pray with me? Almighty God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this time. We're excited to see that perhaps things are starting to change around us and that uh, we may regain a little bit of the, the freedom and spontaneity uh, of, of life of over a year ago. And uh, we are looking forward to that. Lord God, we thank you, though, that no matter what, you are always in our midst and you're always calling us to live the lives that you have asked us to live. And so help us to tune in today to focus in on what you have to say to us. I ask that through the Holy Spirit we would be enlarged in mind and spirit and grow closer to you and to each other. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let me share scripture with you. The two parables, short little parables. The parable of uh, the lost sheep and the lost coin. And we'll sing together and I'll be back and uh, share with you uh, today's message. Luke 15, 1-10 Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable, Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. And he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who do not need to repent. Or suppose a woman has ten silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents.
know, this series is on the parables of Jesus. I've been saying to you that they are Jesus' way of teaching what the life uh, in the kingdom of God is like, and that it is not allegorical, and it's, it's not uh, uh, necessarily for the afterlife. It's about here and now, how we live our lives as followers of Jesus Christ, as, as we focus on God in everything we do, and that radiates into everything that we do. Um, the kingdom of God, and Jesus says this in so many ways, in particular on the Sermon on the Mount, uh, the kingdom of God and, and what it calls us to do is very practical. Uh, it has everyday application. And, and when we follow that application, when we live our lives uh, according to the kingdom of God, the reality that God is here with us and asking us to follow him, there are certain outcomes that uh, are evident in uh, those who live in the kingdom of God. They're not always matched in the world. Uh, but when we have ears to hear, eyes to see, the reality of the kingdom becomes physical. It, it, it's there. It, it is, as I said, practical, and it has outcomes. And one of the main outcomes, I would think, of the kingdom of God, of the gospel of Jesus Christ, is that we learn in umpteen ways that all people have worth and that no one is beyond the reach of God's love. And that for sure, and again, Jesus teaches this in so many ways, that people are not to be uh, discarded or forgotten or thought of less. So today I share uh, two parables that Jesus taught, the lost sheep and the lost coin. And they were taught in response to Pharisees and the teachers of the law who the scriptures tell us muttered. <laughs> I love the word, they muttered. Um, I don't know what would be in your translation that was in mine, uh, in, the, in the NIV that I use for, for uh, uh, my present, you know, my sermons, my, my messages. But they muttered uh, because uh, Jesus was welcoming, quote, sinners and even eating with them. They, they, they just found that, like, that was just way too much. He actually, he ate with them. Um, I will give them their due, that is the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. They were quite preoccupied with the laws of purity, right? Is that, that things could make you unclean and, and potentially not available then to be able to do their duties or to be able to go into the temple or to do the things that were associated with God. But they took that to a point that was really in some ways obsessive. Certainly Jesus did not follow the intensity of their of their uh, purity laws about cleanliness and food and, and, and different things. Um, but also, Jesus would remind them a number of times that uh, even though they were, you know, quite concerned with purity and wondering how he could be eating with sinners, because that would make Jesus unclean, he reminds them in other places that, you know, they may be, uh, you know, wound up about particular part of the law, but other parts of the law they discard when it suits them. For instance, he told them, and I think I preached not too long ago, uh, he said to them, you know, when, when um, uh, your parent, you have to take a look after your parents, your mom and dad, you say, well, I don't really have to because the money I had to potentially to give to them has been given to God. <laughs> And uh, Jesus takes them to task for that. He said, no, no, you can't just do that. And another time, he says to them, you know, like, if your own ox uh, uh, or animal was caught in a ditch on the Sabbath, you would go and uh, uh, get it out of that ditch, would you not? Because when they were questioning whether Jesus should do good on the Sabbath. So even though I say, I, I give them a little benefit of the doubt that they looked at Jesus, you know, uh, eating, uh, you know, down at the cafeteria with all kinds of, you know, weird people, that uh, they they were kind of like they were kind of shocked by it, but at the same time, they were fairly hypocritical about the way the intensity with which they followed the law. They they followed it to some degree, um, and not followed it <laughs> when it suited them. Regardless of their intentions about particular laws or not, and I mean, I do the same thing. I mean, I some things really stick in my mind, and I do them. Other things I just sort of let slide. Uh, but one of the things that we find in a number of ways that the way um, certain people looked at, and particularly the Pharisees, the teachers of the law, that they looked at people as if they were icky, 
I was trying to think of a word, but icky was the one that came to mind. It's just like gross. Like, not, you know, you don't, you don't, you don't touch them. And it's not that they were just icky, kind of, you know, they just need a good bath or, you know, dust them off for fleas or, or, you know, change their clothes. No, no, no. That they were fundamentally icky, you know, fundamentally wrong. And it came across uh, loud and clear in the things that they said. And it meant that people in their mind, because, I mean, he's saying, they're saying, well, Jesus eats with sinners, and he even eats with them. Well, what is up with that, they're thinking? That's just totally wrong. There must be in the back of their mind a sense that those folks, those people, are kind of unredeemable. And to some degree, they're dispensable. Because they're intimating, <laughs> quite loudly, that Jesus should not have been giving them his time and, and his attention, and certainly not his interaction, where potentially he could become impure or uh, get something from them that was unholy, right? That's a bit of a... It's a bit of a club mentality, right? That only we are right and everyone else is wrong. It's a us versus them mentality. And, and remember, what, I, what I'm saying about these particular parables is that they remind us that people are not dispensable. They're, they're not, you know, uh, they're, we don't, we're not allowed to just forget them or, or disown them or ignore them. But that club mentality has this us versus them uh, frame of mind. Um, and and the Pharisees, even you can see it in a number of different approaches or different uh, um, accounts in the Bible told by different people, including Paul even, um, uh, but certainly the gospel writers, that the Pharisees to some degree considered themselves better than other people. And you know what? Maybe they were well behaved. Maybe they really dressed well. Maybe they did all the proper things. They, they, they truly thought they were better and they, that they were more valuable than others. Again, why is Jesus spending time with these losers, these sinners, uh, and even eating with them? It's just kind of weird. They thought themselves they were better than others and they had actually earned their status. They had merit badges to prove it, you know? Um, actually, when I think about it, Jesus criticized them for saying that that you make your tassels, uh, you enlarge your tassels in your phylacteries for everybody to see. That is, the tassels that they would, uh, an observant uh, Jew would put on the corners of his garment. And, uh, and also the phylacteries, which were a little leather box with verses of scripture written inside. Which is kind of a cool thing. And you could either wear it on the wrist or, or read, wear it on the forehead. But Jesus says, you actually make them bigger. And he wasn't actually being uh, joking or making... Um, uh, a, a philosophical point. He, they, they were actually people who were making them more visible for others to see. They're their merit badges, right? Look how holy I am. Look how together I am. Look how, like, I, I deserve what I have. Ultimately, it, it boils down to we're God approved. We're God approved. And hey, God does love everybody, right? But let, let's just. Keep going on this idea. We're God approved. We have our merit badges. We can show them. We do the right things. What are you doing with that rabble over there? So Jesus tells these two very short parables. Shepherd has a hundred sheep and he loses one. One is lost. It wanders away. It says the shepherd leaves the 99 behind. It's not that he doesn't care about them. They're already in the fold. But he is gone. He, he goes to find the one which is lost because it is important to him. It is not a special sheep. Uh, you know, it didn't have a diploma. It, it hadn't done extra good. It, it, it wasn't a rich sheep. It was a lost sheep. And the shepherd goes and finds it. The other 99 are already valued. They're at home. They are safe. They are protected. They are loved. And when the shepherd finds the sheep, you notice this? I'm sure you've been told this a number of times in the Bible studies throughout your life. When, when the shepherd finds it, does, does he kick that sheep back 
and, and curse it all the way back and chew it out for running away and making his life uncomfortable and, and scaring the living daylights out of him? Uh, does he just criticize that sheep all the way home? What does the scripture say? It says he, he carries that sheep on his shoulders and brings it back. <laughs> Truth is, life is messy. I mean, things happen to us in, in life, right? That they're, they're not the easiest things to handle, not the easiest things to process or to try to figure out. Um, we're often, even when we're doing okay, we're not often at our best. We need help and patience and love if we're going through different things, or difficulties, or, or if we're, for, for whatever reason. Um, but, but let's just say someone who is, doesn't know God and is looking for God. I mean, we can understand right then and there that, that this is not a simple process. Unfortunately, many people in the world, and, and I have been guilty of this, and you have too, um, we can... Uh, unfortunately, give people a cold shoulder and our judgment instead of trying to understand where they're at. That we kind of write them off, especially if they get on our nerves and they do things that drive us bonkers, right? We, we just write them off. Um, we, we just judge in, instead of listening, instead of caring uh, for people. But Jesus... Okay? Our Lord and Savior, whom we follow, and he says, do as I have done, love as I have loved you. Jesus offers mercy and grace uh, to the people around him. He goes on to say that, you know, he, he searches for, uh, um, God searches for us like a woman who has lost a coin in her house says that she lights a lamp and, and she sweeps uh, the floor to find it. And when she does, she rejoices and tells her family and her neighbors. And understand this, it's a very ordinary coin. It, is not amount, it does not amount to a lot of money, right? It's not a fortune. Uh, she hasn't searched for a hidden treasure and found it. And this is not to say that Jesus says, that which is lost is really not important. It's actually the opposite. He's making a point that what seems of little value to you and me, that we might not have spent uh, a day looking for $10, um, that what doesn't seem of value to us is of infinite worth to God. He was truly saying that to his people, who people who would have recognized it would have, or heard him would have understood that he wasn't talking about a tremendous amount of money. He was just talking about something that was lost. And the woman, when she finds it, rejoices because she has found it. And Jesus goes on to say that God rejoices uh, for every person that comes to him, that repents to him, that is found, you know, that lost and found more than anything. You know, we kind of want to say, well, I, you know, I matter too, you know. <laughs> yeah, we do. We absolutely do. But Jesus says, I'm also searching for those who are far from me. And I won't make them dispensable. I won't forget about them. I won't just lay them with my judgment and write them off. At one time, churches were very proper. Um, it, it, it's not that way now. And you know what? There's a kind of a prudish side to me that says, you know what? We should smarten up and get a little bit more, you know, formal in church and stuff. But really, at one time, churches could be like so, so proper and so, you know, everything had to be right that, that it, was, it was slightly intimidating. And there's a danger there. Uh, when church is so proper and so perfect and, and God forbid any mistakes or any, any kind of sense that things are out of control or we don't know what to do, um, there's a danger there that people who come to those churches, and again, I think this is lessening over time. In fact, attendance to church is lessening, but that's another story and we will talk about that in uh, a series in the fall. But there's a danger that people who came to church or thought about coming to church would already uh, have this sense that they had to have their act together. Um, and no rough edges or, you know, be careful about 
telling about imperfect situations, backgrounds that they're in. They, they would kind of almost have to pretend uh, what, um, you know, who they are and what they were doing because it would, it, this place, you know, not this place, but churches could be so formal that they didn't feel safe. And, and years ago, I've told you that no one comes into big, huge churches like this one. I mean, it's beautiful. And I mean, for us, we look at it and go, wow, this place is amazing. Um, but many people in the world, well, it's the last place they're actually going to come in. It looks scary. I mean, it, it looks scary. You think they're actually going to walk in on a Sunday and say, you know what, I'm going to go into church. Maybe some people would, maybe. But the majority of people would say, whoa, no thank you. And it's not that we've done anything wrong or... Um, I'm just saying the church in itself is the building and, 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 and uh, the, the, the actions within, you know, the service don't necessarily draw anybody. And certainly it, it doesn't help when a church could make it so that you almost had to fake it, right? That you, that you, you had to pretend who, that you were something else, right? That you didn't have rough edges, that your life wasn't all together, that, that maybe you had things that you had to work out or had done things in your past that were, um, you know, uh, things that you were ashamed of. And it happens to people that are in the church themselves where they, they don't want to disclose necessarily the things that they've done uh, or mistakes that they've made because they're not sure they're going to be held, uh, 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 you know, uh, not judged by by that. Um, and the thing is that when that becomes almost enshrined in that everything has to be perfect, we can dismiss people, maybe not even realizing it, completely unintentionally, right? That we we look so together, so perfect, and everything is so right down the middle of the line that people just say, well, I, I really don't fit. Um, again, sometimes that is unintentional. And churches can learn, right, to say, wow, like, you know, we got to loosen up just a little bit. we got to be more welcoming. In the, but again, this is actually for a later series. I'll, I'll be talking about that. And, and understand this. I love all of you. you. You guys do a fantastic job. We're not a huge church. And we're, we, you know, we're, we're going to experience difficulties in the next few years uh, with the way things are changing uh, in society. Uh, and the things that we have to, you know, uh, sort of, uh, when I say I'm going to have a series on it, it's not that I, I think that you're not doing a good job, because uh, you are actually a really cool group of people, very different in many ways, and um, come from different walks of life and different backgrounds, and, and you do actually go out of your way to look at, you know, to, to be friendly and to be helpful to people and to, and, and not just say hello, but actually get to know people and try to be of help in any way or a friend, Right. The thing is, though, some people actually dismiss people intentionally. You know, unintentionally, it, it, it's bad, but I, it's, I can understand it, right? But some people dismiss others intentionally. And sometimes, sometimes we think we have every reason to do so. <laughs> they somehow... They don't measure up. They should have gotten their act together. What on earth were they doing? Why don't they figure things out? Uh, any number of things. Actually doing things that I don't like. Type of background that I don't understand. I, you know, many, many reasons for that. People can be intentional about dismissing others. I'll just leave it here in terms that it's good to remember that Jesus calls us to mercy and to grace. As these two um, short little, little parables tell us, that the shepherd goes and finds the lost sheep, and, and the woman lights a lamp and sweeps the floor to find that lost coin, because they have value in themselves. And God is... He loves everybody, right? Yes, we point to Jesus. And there are standards that we follow. I, I had a friend, I have told you this, that years ago, many, many years ago, he said to me, and, and I'm not telling you this because I think I actually do. It just was a weird thing for him to say. He said, your problem is that you love too much. 
In other words, that I somehow didn't have standards because anything goes as long as we're all lovey-dovey. One, I am not loving like that because some days I'm not. I, sometimes I think, Lord, did I ever mess that up royally today? We have standards. And we are called to live for Jesus Christ. And he does expect a quality of life, a visible quality in his followers. So I don't say anything goes in the world. But I have to say, if we want to share our faith, if we want people to know that God is love, that God loves them, that, that he would rejoice in having that person come to him, we have to live it. Right? We have to be relational. That is, we have to have relationships with people. We have to be friends with people. And yes, eat meals with them. I mean, it makes perfect sense that Jesus would be talking to these folks and even eating with them and not worrying that somehow he was made impure and that somehow God was frowning because it was the opposite. He tells us this is what God is doing. If you're already in the fold, praise the Lord. And God says, I love you. You are with me. But I'm also seeking others. So I would say, if we're going to help God in this way, because it is through the Holy Spirit. People come to God through the Holy Spirit. Now, we can't really argue a person into faith. It, it is the work of the Holy Spirit. But it comes with some patience and some love and some desire to be with people and not label them and not dismiss them right off the bat. And yes, eat our meals with them and be with them, be associated with them. I said that it makes perfect sense that Jesus ate, quote, with, quote, sinners, <laughs> as nasty as that looks. Because in Philippians, we read that Jesus being the very image of God became or came to earth in the form of a servant. Actually, the translation, the many translations, in the form of a slave. Where he was not there to just beat his own drum or to say how amazing he was, but simply to love and to bring others to him and to God, to repentance and to change through love and through grace. If there's a little ending practical thing that I can say to you, and this is, can be hard to do and I'm as guilty as anybody, is that we are called by these two parables. We're called to see people in a very different way than often the world sees. People that are not like them or different or in different situations. Uh, different backgrounds, different economic uh, uh, um, um, levels, or different countries, uh, different religions. We're asked, to, you know, we're asked to see people not from our own pedestal, from up there, from where we think we're better than anybody else, but from the perspective, the ground, you know, the ground level perspective of God's love and mercy. I wish, I, I, I encourage you to apply that in, in everything that you do. Let me, say you, let me say this again. That we don't look at people from on top of our pedestal looking down, but that we are at their level and that we see them with God's love. We don't always measure up. But if we follow, if we take things like the parable of the lost sheep and the lost coin, and make them practical. Think on them. Pray about them. There is a great outcome. Remember I said there is outcomes. One of the greatest outcomes is that we start to see people with the love of God. And that makes all the difference in the world. Not only for potentially them finding their way to God, but also creating a world and a society and a world that is more loving and more less judgmental, and simply more loving. All right? Um, leave it there. And um, amen. <laughs> I'm trying to think what else to say about minister. Just be quiet. 
Uh, let's just keep it at amen. Praise the Lord. Uh, let's take a moment then uh, to listen to a hymn and um, be back with and pray with you. <laughs> Oh 
Well, again, a special blessing on this Father's Day. And I do hope that you're able to be uh, together with family today. Uh, blessings, and I hope that uh, it really is a good day today. Um, as we begin to reopen uh, the, the province and things look like the, some of the restrictions are, are lessening, uh, we look forward to just being able to have a, a little bit more freedom and a little more spontaneity. And certainly we are starting uh, our worship services again starting next Sunday and it's going to be Communion Day. Uh, if you would uh, care to join us in, in, in the sanctuary, please uh, bring, uh, bring a piece of bread and some juice. Uh, with you, or if you uh, if you care to do so, you can use uh, one of the disposable wafer and juice packets that we have here in the sanctuary, and you're certainly welcome to use those at home. If you're still uh, you know nervous about being out in public, and I totally understand, uh, we will have the worship service uh, uh, posted online later in the day, and again have some bread and juice ready for you ready for when that part of the the worship service comes, so that you can share with us in communion. It won't matter whether you're in the sanctuary or at home, the Holy Spirit is there and the reality of God in the world, Jesus in the world, is very much uh, the same no matter what the circumstances in the world. So uh, I look forward to seeing you and I really look forward to being able to be, you know, perhaps more and more able to do the things like we miss, like singing and visiting and doing all the things that uh, we just took for granted in church. And uh, I hope that's coming sooner uh, than later. Uh, but uh, would you uh, pray with me? Almighty God, we thank you again, week after week, that you are not limited by this pandemic. It has been tough, Lord God, and tougher for some, far tougher for some than for others. We pray, Lord God, that you would be at work in the world. I know you are. We know you are, that you are in the work at work uh, through your Holy Spirit and through the agencies and the people that you motivate. And pray that you would be uh, a, a absolute solid help to everyone who needs you as in, in such difficult circumstances. We look forward to the, the day when uh, there will be a little more freedom, a little more spontaneity, a little ability to do the things that we so took for granted May it be then that we perhaps value them uh, like never before. Lord God, we pray for our church and the churches in our town and around the world. Uh, as they begin to open up, we pray that uh, you would be there through your Holy Spirit and encourage them. It's been rough. It's been hard to adjust. It's, it, it was such a quick change and, and, and a turnabout of how we're doing things. Lord, we pray that your churches will um, be blessed by you and be able to return to the things that they did and, and uh, have been doing in different ways. But uh, we pray that uh, with the uh, relaxing uh, of this virus, uh, the, the, the restrictions that it has brought about, that um, your, your church can grow and, and people can get together and worship and do ministry together. Lord God, we pray for the world and we pray for our, our city and our province. Uh, all the decisions that are made are not always 100% and sometimes we don't always have all the information. And certainly our leaders at times, uh, I, you know, it is a hard job to, to know what to do and, and when. Pray that decisions would always be the most common, you know, the, with the most common sense uh, with the most people involved and pray that they, they wouldn't be decisions made by interest groups, but that instead they would look to the totality of the people, uh, the population, the, the, uh, uh, everyone who is affected. And so we pray for our leaders, um, pray that they would um, serve this country in the best way possible. As we emerge too, Lord God, may we emerge into a world that, even though it's not the same, that we would do it with confidence and with hope and with expectation that you will lead the way as you have led many times before. Give us unity as, as people, as a nation, and as the world. There are still strong divisions in the world, and I pray that in every way uh, we would find ways to grow together as opposed to farther apart. I don't know the answer to that, Lord God, but your Holy Spirit does, and it, and it always starts in us. Lord, we confess when we go wrong, when we go our own way, when we let our tempers flare or our attitudes take over or our situation be more important than anybody else. Lord, we ask your forgiveness. Uh, help, us to, um, help us to acknowledge that. 
come to you and say, Lord, we, we have not been at our best. And to then do the exact opposite, <laughs> to, to do the best, uh, led by you. We pray that um, as we live this day, and uh, this Father's Day, and this uh, week to come, and this month to come, that we would live it under your blessing and that that would generate, generate generosity and uh, thanksgiving in our lives so that everything we have been given would be uh, a, a way to uh, help everyone around us. Lord God, I ask your blessing up on these good people. Uh, may you be with them in everything they do. I ask this in your precious name, Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. My friends, um, hey, if it's possible, I may be seeing you this Sunday if you want to come to the sanctuary, and I hope that I can see you there. And um, one last thing, too, I, I'll be sending an email, but uh, just remember, if you haven't uh, attended church in the last year, and you're not on our master list that we use for um, tra uh, tracing purposes, uh, please uh, call the office, let them know that you're going to come. And it doesn't mean that you have to uh, or that you're obligated to, but just if you're in thinking you're going to come and you haven't called us before, give us your name and your number so that we can add you to your master list. Once that's done, you don't have to call again. We just simply have a list and we check it off when people come into the sanctuary. Again, just for tracing purposes. And uh, again, I hope I see you. And if not, uh, we will see each other through the Holy Spirit, uh, through these videos and also through phone and uh, through any other means that we can get together. God bless you. I'm, I'm so looking forward to seeing you. See you soon.